principle is diplomatic privilege. You know, this is the ultimate form of bypassing surveillance. Of course you cannot search my possession. I am a diplomat. Um, there's the clear system, which is now defunct and maybe coming back again at some point, which, if you bought into it, allowed you to bypass certain parts of airport security. Or you can just get driven into your office building in a private limo driven by an off-duty cop with dark tinted windows, you know, and pay to have the plates changed every now and then. Um, another interesting note in this category is the collusion of surveillance technology in restricting speech in public-private areas like malls. So in those cases, the division isn't simply between the social categories of, you know, who the likely offenders are, but between those who are willing to remain silent or who agree with management and those who, um, you know, those who actually want to speak up and say something. So we've seen kind of a consistent pattern here in the effects of surveillance. Um, you know, surveillance can be good and bad, but it's an activity which directly embodies the power structures of the societies that perform it. The technologies that um, implement surveillance render these social structures very literally in steel and glass and silicon and embed it into the fabric of the city in a, you know, in a very literal sense. You know, these things are being built into buildings, into subways, into streets. Um, in more and more ubiquitous ways. So we have a consistent pattern where people with money or power or social status can either act less to be watched in bad ways and more in good ways or simply enjoy greater protection as a secondary effect of their social standing. It's just sort of another reflection of the ubiquitous privilege that they move through. Um, often completely unaware that everyone doesn't experience the same kind of surveillance profile. This shows no signs of stopping. Um, on the contrary, there's a whole class of initiatives called smart city initiatives, which among other things are looking at pushing things like environmental monitoring, a lot of the kinds of good surveillance out to portable devices. So you have like, oh, your smartphone can be an air quality monitor, that kind of thing. You know, this may be good in the end, but in the meantime, the gadgets that are enabling this kind of thing are luxury devices. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people in the room have them, but they're not free, they're not even necessarily cheap, and this is reproducing the same kind of cultural divide. You know, it may propagate down in the end, but it's not going to happen immediately. So what can we do about all of this? Um, both the growing surveillance state and the inequality in surveillance need to be addressed kind of in equal measure. Hackers and makers are in a really interesting and unique place here. We have both the technical background in the systems and often the socio-political understanding to see the full breadth of the problem. We also have at least a somewhat organized community that can work together, albeit in a very sort of distributed way. Um, we're in some ways a very privileged group, but in other ways we're a frequently fairly marginalized group. This puts us in a position of, if we try, being able to reach out kind of in both directions. So there are four things that we can do, roughly speaking. We can document the problem, we can raise awareness of it, we can work to change existing projects that are being implemented directly, and we can subvert these systems. In a lot of ways, this is the same catalog of tactics that's true for any kind of social change, any kind of social movement. Um, and like any other social change movement, there are existing groups working in a lot of these areas. If you work with these groups, you can have more of an effect. So the details of the ways that different groups watch us and what happens to that data are not often public and they're certainly not aggregated and actively publicized. Helping to find and collate this kind of information is a basic first step for any kind of other work. You can't um, you know, try to talk to people about this before you understand the scope of the problem and how the system is working. This can be as simple as doing things like marking and updating maps of where surveillance cameras are in neighborhoods. On the other hand, it can be a lot more involved. Um, it can mean doing background research on the technical systems that are used for surveillance. It can mean filing Freedom of Information Acts or whatever the local inter um, equivalents are in other countries to find out what's going on with these systems. It can mean reverse engineering, you know, physical examples of the surveillance systems themselves and documenting them. 
There's an interesting uh, case of this that happened recently in Seattle. There was a wrongful arrest case involving a hacker, and the police weren't forthcoming of video evidence that was relevant to the case. You know, oh, it got deleted. So the, uh, the guy in question wasn't really willing to take that answer, so he determined that the surveillance management system that the police were using kept secure logs any time media was deleted, and he had his lawyers request the logs. You know, clearly the police should be able to back up their, uh, their supposition that this data was deleted with the logs. So he analyzed the log files, figured out how they marked data and how they tracked it, and uh, proved that the video did still exist. It was, you know, this video can be deleted after 90 days, but it's kept on a space available basis. So then he went back to the police and said, well, no, this video still exists. Here's the proof. Turn over the video data. They did. So now this means, um, and this, this same, you know, most surveillance video management systems used by the police do the same thing. Now lawyers who are in the same position with their clients can take the same action. They can request the logs, have somebody analyze those logs, and see if the video is actually gone. And also, because the surveillance systems are actually somewhat decently designed, there it shows the difference if data is ever manually deleted. So if the police want to go and say, oh, well, that data was deleted, well, no, that data was deleted by this user intentionally, you know, that's a very different position in court, and a judge can take that into account, even if they can't find out why the data was deleted or get it back. So. It's not just enough for us to understand these issues any more than it is for the knowledge of these issues to be fragmented and not really centrally, uh, centrally brought together as a cohesive image. The rest of the world needs to understand this too. We've been telling people about um, obviously computer security and also online privacy for a really long time. But we need to start, telling, uh, we need to start speaking up more and talking to the larger community and saying, hey, all of these issues that we've been talking about in terms of online security, yeah, these happen at your grocery store now too. You need to deal with them there as well. You need to deal with this, you know, you need to start thinking about the same kinds of actions. Um, you know, and, and it's important to get through the message as well that this kind of surveillance doesn't necessarily help you. Just because you're on video doesn't make you safer. Most new surveillance projects and the legal structures that new surveillance projects are built on aren't created in a total vacuum, which gives us a place to act. Um, this is the kind of the usual stuff of civic activism, um, whether that means protest or contact with lawmakers or raising the issue of surveillance at planning meetings, getting into all the annoying technical stuff, whatever. Um, one of the really interesting issues here is that modern surveillance exists kind of at a couple of levels. It can exist at like the national law level and at sort of the internet level, but it also is very specifically geographically um, located. You know, surveillance cameras may be plugged into the cloud, but they exist in one specific physical location, and you have to act on both sides. You know, there's both the, well, what if the U.S. had national privacy protection laws like Europe does, and then there's the, hey, you know, let's go talk to the businesses that we interact with and say down to the guy at the bodega, hey, you realize that that camera isn't going to stop somebody from robbing your store, but it does mean that those video records can be subpoenaed if the police think you're dealing drugs and want to harass you. Um, you know, so you have to kind of work at both levels like that. Subverting systems is something we're really good at. It's kind of what we do. It can take a lot of different forms. You can have pranks that just show how ridiculous this whole surveillance culture is. Um, but it can also be practical tools and techniques for either avoiding surveillance and the problem or just for countering the power dynamic that it creates. Um, you've got things like uh, the Tor project that Jake was talking about in the other room for proxying content and fighting traffic analysis. And you've got OTR for secure messaging that both exist for getting around the first problem of dealing with um, avoiding surveillance. But uh, in the last part of this talk, I'm going to talk about a new competition for projects in the second category to help equalize the power balance in terms of surveillance. So the greatest power imbalance in the sphere of surveillance exists between the private citizen and the state. And this is most exacerbated when the citizen is trying to take action against state violence. 
police and military brutality is real and it happens all the time and it happens all over the world in every country. The worst excesses happen when no one is watching. Even though surveillance tools are widely deployed throughout the world, there are many countries where surveillance is only ever going to be a tool of oppression, where it's never going to work for you. In a lot of situations, there's no question whether or not you're going to show up on video, and that if that video can be used to incriminate you, it will be. This is especially true for large political demonstrations. However, if the state decides to suppress a demonstration, especially if, they're, if they do decide that, yeah, we're just gonna send in the tanks and you know, shoot everything that moves or you know, whatever, especially in the more brutal suppressions, they often suppress the video. They don't want anybody seeing them doing this. Um, it's questionable at best if getting video out from places like Burma or Iran can actually material, materially affect the situation on the ground in an immediate sense, but on the other hand, it does affect public opinion in the long term. You know, if you look at the, the Nena case in Iran, that was a huge, huge organizing point that really prolonged those protests and really prolonged public support because that video got out. Um, even more interesting to us are cases where there is recourse to the rule of law, you know, that you can actually take action after the fact, but there's still significant corruption. You know, the police are still going in there and beating people up. This is a really big part of the world, both the developing world and the developed world. So the obvious way to fix this is to just shoot your own video. You can't install a citywide camera network. It's too expensive, it's not a reasonable thing to do, but you don't have to. All you need is a few cameras that are in the right place at the right time. You can use a phone that shoots video or a cheap, you know, handheld camera, but there are four problems with them. First, do you really want to be the guy standing in front of the group of riot cops holding up the video camera, watching them beat the crap out of some guy when there's 200 of them and one of you? No, you don't. Um, second, if you can't get their badge numbers down, it's a lot harder to take action afterwards. When you're like waving your camera running away from those 200 riot cops, you're not recording anything useful. I mean, it might be useful for PR, but it's not useful in court. Um, the video is stuck on your camera until it gets uploaded. When the riot cops catch up to you and take you in, even if they didn't see you holding up the camera, they're still gonna beat the crap out of you when they look on your phone. And if you don't let them see your phone, they'll just beat the crap out of you until you do. Um, fourth, there's no way to collate this video or manage it online. Yeah, you can put those videos on YouTube, but what if you happen to be in an area where the cameras didn't get a good look at everybody's face? Do you really want to, you know, or you got a much better look, or you recorded a snippet of conversation that lets somebody identify something? You don't necessarily want that video going out public right away because that can get people killed. Um, every jurisdiction also has different rules around what you can record and what you can't record. If you have a system that's capable of recording audio and you use it to record stuff on the street, even if you're not recording audio, you can still sometimes get arrested for wiretap. Um, so if you're building a system for the US, you'd really like it to not be able to record audio because then you can just tell the cops, no, no, no microphone. You know, They may arrest you anyway, but it's a lot harder and it's much, much harder to prove that that's wrongful arrest after the fact. On the other hand, you know, 50% of the world has a cell phone and a lot of those phones are gonna be recording video in a few years. So in the interest of, of kind of leveling the playing field a bit, I want to announce a competition um, to build deployable video cameras. A combination of off-the-shelf components, open hardware, and free software that can be deployed in an urban environment. Um, there are three categories, aerial cameras, static cameras, and software-only solutions to run on existing mobiles that provide discrete live uploading and appropriate media management. So for UAV, I mean, Maybe somebody will build a, a fixed wing, you know, actually flying option, but much more likely it's going to be like the quadcopter that perches on the roof and can sit and stare, you know, and it can get up there and it's still a fairly cheap platform, but it can go places nothing else can. Or it's the camera that, you know, you throw over a phone line like a pair of shoes and it hangs out up there and so you tell it to just drop and pick it up later. The goal of the competition is to spur work on these kind of devices and similar ones um, as much as it, is, as it is to develop immediately fieldable solutions. Um, it's probably going to take